Hello, everybody. This is Joel over at Load Track. We'll start at 12 o'clock noon central. So thank you for joining. And again, we will start at 12 o'clock noon central. Sorry, Joel, I had to take a call there. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Joel over Low Trek. Thank you for joining our webinar. It's 11.55 in Texas, 12.55 on the East Coast. We'll be starting in five minutes. Uh, you can start thinking about your questions now and queue them up. You may send them to info at loadtrek.net. That's info, I-N-F-O, at loadtrek.net. After the uh, webinar today, we'll have some time for questions and answers. We'll talk to you in five minutes. Thank you. 
Hello there, Joel again at Low Drag. Thank you for joining our webinar. We'll start in two minutes. If you have any questions for Dave, uh, please send them to info at lowtrack.net. That's info at lowtrack.net. We're glad you joined us and we'll be starting promptly in two minutes. Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's 12 o'clock noon here in Texas. It's 1 o'clock in the afternoon in Washington, D.C., where Dave Oshecki is joining us from. Thank you for joining us. Low Trek presents um, an educational webinar on the new uh, drug and alcohol clearinghouse. Uh, in this webinar, you're going to learn about the uh, new clearinghouse, its timeline for implementation, a review of the new clearinghouse rules, including the motor carrier requirements, driver responsibilities, third-party drug testing service providers. And remember, this deadline is uh, less than six months away, so this is important. I know back when I was a terminal manager, as early as 1994, we were looking for something like this. Well, this something is here. What is it? What does it mean to us? Will we even like it when we see it? We will find out. So thank you for joining us. Again, this is sponsored by Load Trek. My name is Joel. Glad that you're here. Uh, Load Trek is a single cloud-based uh, transportation management system that provides ELDs, telematics, IFTA, uh, driver pay and timekeeping, and in my opinion, the most important things, routing and dispatch and financial analysis to select private fleets. Uh, select um, for hire trucking fleets that are in certain uh, industry uh, segments and uh, U.S. federal government uh, fleet contractors. I am really happy to introduce you to Dave Oshecki. Dave's got a long uh, history in our industry. He didn't ask for this lengthy introduction, nor did he know he's going to get it, but I'm really happy Dave is here. Nobody is better suited to talk about this subject than Dave Oshecki. He was with um, uh, FMCSA, actually the predecessor of FMCSA. FMCSA didn't come around until about 2000. He was with the uh, Office of Motor Carriers over at Federal Highway Administration. Uh, he started in the field. Uh, maybe some of you on this call had the pleasure of him doing an audit on you. Uh, moved to headquarters. And then for the last 20 years, he has been our advocate in Washington, D.C., uh, working for and with the American Trucking Association on behalf of the trucking industry. Did tremendous work, uh, did a great job, and now he is the president of Scopolitis Transportation Consulting. Scopolitis uh, is the largest transportation law firm in the nation, and Scopolitis Transportation Consulting does a wonderful job. Uh, I, I can tell you this, they've been very helpful to us at Lowtrek. They've been very helpful to some of our clients. And if you're a big company, it certainly doesn't help to get a second opinion. Uh, if you're a small company and think you can't afford it, uh, 
Uh, I would simply say this, getting advice and guidance before you need it is always easier and cheaper than after you need it. So with that, uh, Dave, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you for joining us this morning. Well, thanks, Joel. And uh, I've, I've successfully taken myself off of mute, which is always, always one of my challenges at the beginning of webinars. But I, I really appreciate um, the introduction and, and, you know, more importantly, the opportunity to partner with LoadTrack and yourself. Uh, uh, you do a super job as an organization and as a technology company and technology provider. And uh, just thanks for, for the chance to do this. Um, again, for, for those who have logged on and, and, and dialed in to listen, um, thank you for taking the time. Again, my name is Dave Oshecki. I head up uh, Scope Leaders Transportation Consulting. And, and uh, I certainly didn't know that, that Joel was going to use the, sort of the long version of the, the bio, um, but I have been around for quite a while. Um, and to, to Joel's point that he made when he was a terminal manager back in the mid-1990s, I had the pleasure and opportunity to help uh, write the, the drug and alcohol testing rules when I was with the Office of Motor Carriers way back before it was FMCSA. And of course, I'm dating myself, but you know, at this point. But uh, uh, so I've been around the, the industry and drug and alcohol testing and, and this whole clearinghouse idea for, for many years, just as, you know, as, as long as Joel has. And, uh, you know, it was 20 years ago, it was 1999 when Congress initially uh, asked the FMCSA when they were when they were creating the organization, standing it up, if you will, uh, to take a hard look at whether a clearinghouse was needed, uh, and if it was needed, would it be a cost-effective approach for the industry? And and you know, so fast forward 20 years, here we are. We have a regulation. Uh, we're now getting close to the implementation of the the National Clearinghouse, and we'll talk through that uh, as we go here. So uh, I think I've got control of the slides, and I'm going to try to. Uh, here we go. So this this goes to um, the overview that, that Joel already quickly covered. We'll talk the timeline and, a, and a, at a high level, the clearinghouse, but then we'll start getting into the details, the registration requirements, the motor carrier specific requirements. And while there are not a whole host of driver requirements, there are some and we'll talk through those. Um, and then some record retention obligations that motor carriers and others have as well as some other important elements of the regulation or rule itself. And uh, many of you know that this clearinghouse is not yet um, stood up uh, officially. Uh, it's not open for business yet. So though, as a result of that, there are some things that we don't yet know. And you know, we want to be candid and upfront about that. And, and we'll talk about those towards the end. And uh, we also, and I'm a firm believer in, well, I hope you find value in the, in the prepared presentation and, and the, the PowerPoint slides and the information presented. I'm a believer that the Q&A session uh, is where a lot of the value is in webinars and seminars. Uh, so we're going to try to leave, uh, from an expectation standpoint, we're going to try, try to leave at least 10 to 15 minutes for Q&As. Uh, and uh, therefore, that, that means I'm going to try to wrap up my prepared remarks in about 40 to 45 minutes. So with that said, Let's just go ahead and uh, get into some of the details. Okay, so let's let's look at the timeline. Um, and this is not a timeline that I created. This is something that the FMCSA created. Uh, the, the clearinghouse rules were published way back in, in December of 2016. This was at the very tail end of the Obama administration. Uh, and this was one of the regulations that uh, when, when any, you know, uh, presidential transition occurs, uh, particularly from, you know, one party to the next, uh, the next party takes a hard look at all the regulations that were published late in the game of the past administration. And this is one of those, right? So the Trump administration came in in early 2017 and took a hard look at this clearinghouse rule and said, gosh, you know, there, there's a lot of regulations here. There's some potential burdens. There's going to be cost on in the industry. Are there enough potential benefits and safety related benefits for, for trucking and for the motor carrier industry to allow this to go forward? And, and the administ Trump administration came to the conclusion that yes, the, there, there are enough benefits. So, you know, here we are in uh, between February and October of 2019. So in February, that's on the timeline because that was the, the launch of the information phase launched by FMCSA. Uh, they, they put out a, a clearinghouse website. Now that's not the clearinghouse itself. That's just a, an education and awareness website. And some of you I'm sure have already been there, maybe others not. Uh, and there, I think we've got a URL in the, one of the slides later on. Uh, and you can go to that website and sub subscribe 
for email updates, to, to get email updates uh, as FMCSA adds information to that website, as they put out information for the industry to, uh, to, to be aware of. So I encourage you to do, do that, and we'll talk more about that as we go. Um, the registration period for motor carriers and drivers and other users of the clearinghouse is expected to, uh, to open up in October of 2019, so just a couple of months from now. Now, that's not a hard and fast date. There are always seemingly delays with uh, information technology projects, and we don't yet know if there's going to be any delays with this. I, I doubt it, um, uh, but it's, it's certainly a possibility. But that's that's the projection at this point, October of 2019, so a couple months away uh, before the, the registration period starts. January 6th is the firm implementation date. That's in the, in the regulations. That's the data which mandatory reporting into the clearinghouse, and we'll talk much more about the data that needs to be reported into the clearinghouse, as well as uh, information and data that needs to be pulled out of the clearinghouse. Um, so that's, that's uh, that essentially that's the compliance date. And then the last date on this slide, January 6th of 2023, that, that's three years after the, the compliance date, and we'll talk about what meaning that particular date has uh, towards the end of the webinar. So quick look at the timeline now, getting into uh, some of the details, although at, at a very high level, right? Um, so this clearinghouse is a prospective violation repository. It's a database that's gonna uh, contain violation information, but it's only inf violations that are, that are happening on or after January 6th of 2020, so that, that's you know, that's why the word prospective there. It's it's going forward. So even if even if a violation occurs on January second or January third or fourth or fifth, uh, and that driver is you know disqualified and has to go through the um, the substance abuse evaluation process and return to all of that, you know, all of those obligations, that doesn't get in the clearinghouse because it's only violations that occur on or after January sixth. And I think that's an important point to make. Um, Information on whether a driver has successfully completed the return to duty process post violation that will be in the clearinghouse, and and that's of course, you know, one of the reasons for this this uh, this whole initiative to begin with. Uh, there are a number of authorized users, but only those authorized users, including motor carrier employers and other types of employers of CDL holders, uh, along with FMCSA and states, are going to be able to register, access, and query the clearinghouse for their designated purposes. So there are a number of users, and we'll talk more about them. Um, I, I just mentioned you know, state law enforcement and state driver licensing agencies, which is what SDLA stands for. Um, they will have access to the clearinghouse, but they have limited access in terms of, of being able to see information in there. They're only going to be able to see uh, the, the, the driver's eligibility status. And of course, that's for um, for you know, roadside inspection uh, queries as well as for CDL licensing queries by the state licensing agencies. Um, drivers are going to have access to the clearinghouse if they want to, uh, if they choose to register, and not all of them will have to register, and we'll talk more about that as we go, uh, but they'll be able to access their own information. And if they are moving from company to company or applying to new companies, they're going to have to register and then provide consent to these queries uh, by the by the prospective employer. Uh, and again, I, I don't I don't want to keep saying we'll get into this, but we will. Um, Clearinghouse will meet relative uh, federal security standards. That's that's an FMCSA uh, thing that's going to be on them, not the industry. Uh, but it's going to have to be fairly tightly controlled in terms of access and security and so forth. Uh, and the other thing I thought I would mention is. This organization called Volpe, uh, Volpe Transportation System Center, you may or may not be familiar with Volpe. Um, they are actually a part of the U.S. Department of Transportation. That's the part of DOT that's helping FMCSA create the clearinghouse and, uh, and standing it up. Volpe is, if it sounds familiar to you, they're the part of DOT that helped FMCSA create uh, the CSA program. Uh, so Volpe's been around for a long time, and they're all, think of them as an internal DOT contractor to help various administrations like FMCSA, like FAA, and others, you know, build certain systems and help them do their job. Uh, a few more things on the overview. It's a push and a pull system. Now, that, those are not words you're going to find in the regulations. Those are my words, but that's how I think about it. Uh, the industry is going to have to push information into the clearinghouse and the industry is going to have to pull information out of the clearinghouse. So I think of it as a push and a pull system. Uh, 
Uh, in terms of pulling information or data out, there are two types uh, of polls or two types of queries. There's a limited query and a full query, uh, and we're going to get into the details of those here real shortly. Those required to use the clearinghouse uh, are drivers who hold CDLs or commercial li uh, learners permits, CLPs, uh, the employers of CDL drivers who operate CMVs, consortia or third-party administrators, the old TPAs, and, and you know, if you've been in the industry for any period of time and you're dealing with drug and alcohol testing programs, you know mo most carriers do not uh, you know, they, they administer a program, but they don't, they don't, uh, they oversee a program. They don't actually uh, administer the program themselves. They use, you know, outside parties to, to help with the collection and outside parties, of course, for the testing and MRO. So it's very much a, a collaborative testing approach and therefore consortium third party administrators have a role in the clearinghouse. MRO, SAPs, state driver licensing agencies as well. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time in those categories on today's. This is a pretty big lift um, for FMCSA and for the DOT because it's an estimated um, uh, to include about four to six million users. Uh, the government's not going to know until they firmly stand this up and, and really get it running. Uh, but it's a, it's a pretty big system and therefore there's lots of data, lots of information to, uh, that will be in it and therefore, you know, the, the importance of those security standards that we talked about. Okay. Um, so who does what? And there's a lot of information on this slide, and I, I'm not going to cover all of it. I, I would uh, train your eyes on really two to three rows. Look, look at the driver row, if you will, um, and there are check marks, of course, in the various columns. Uh, some drivers are going to have to register as users. Um, those drivers, if uh, they have to consent to a full query because a full query is being made, uh, seeking information about that driver, they're going to have to consent to that full query in the clearinghouse. Um, and the drivers also have to select the substance abuse professional in the clearinghouse. So that's, those are the driver obligations um, at a very high level. Now, employers uh, have a lot of obligations with respect to the clearinghouse. And as you can see, the employer and the consortium and third-party administrators, they have mostly the same columns checked. So the employer has to register as a user, they have to manage assistance. Well, what, what does that mean? You know, that means if a, if a carrier employer is a fairly, you know, medium or fairly large size company, they might have multiple people who, um, who need to access the clearinghouse. So those are, somebody is going to be a uh, administrator, a program administrator within a trucking company. And if, if that uh, trucking company has multiple users of the clearinghouse, that administrator is going to have to manage who uses it and make sure that the list is is up to date and so forth. Um, they're going to have to the employer is going to have to select a consortium of third party administrator uh, and designate that person to help them uh, with obligations. They're going to have to make the request. You can see I'm not going to go through you know all of these, but you can see the requirements. And this is the chart that we didn't create. Again, this is the chart from the FMCSA. So uh, probably enough about that. So let's let's start getting into some of the details. Uh, you know, below the overview, if you will. So in terms of registration, that's one of the first things that's going to happen, right? The, you know, approximately October, a couple months from now, motor carriers are going to have to register, and, and motor carriers would include the Canadian or Mexican, you know, domiciled or based motor carriers if their CDL drivers operate into the U.S. And, and I, I'm using CDL in a generic fashion there because they have their own licensing systems in Canada and Mexico, but they're they're consistent with or harmonized with the U.S. CDL standards. Um, but the motor carrier is going to have to register using their DOT number, not their employer identification number or tax number. They're going to have to provide this list of authorized users. So if it's a relatively small company and there's only one person in the, the safety or HR department that, that will be the user, that, that's fine. That person registered uh, registers. If it's a little larger company and, and, the, and the safety department and the HR department might have, let's say, four users, uh, those four users will have to be listed, and then that list has to be re-upped or reauthorized at least annually within the clearinghouse to make sure that it's it's a you know relatively accurate list. Um, the motor carrier may designate this service agent, a service agent, to to push and to pull records to to help the motor carrier with their obligations. So that's certainly authorized within the rules. Um, and in this case. While the list of users, uh, you know, within the employer, within the motor carrier, has to be re-upped or reauthorized annually, uh, 
if a service agent changes, if a motor carrier chooses a different service agent throughout the year because of cost or, or whatever, um, that carrier has only 10 days to make sure that they update that service agent within the clearinghouse. Um, a motor carrier is not required to designate which uh, medical review officer, MRO, uh, will report information on their behalf. The MRO themselves or that person is going to have to register. Uh, so that's a separate, separate obligation for the MRO and not on, on the carrier's back. Um, and any registration for, for a motor carrier or employer is valid for five years unless it's canceled or revo revoked, and, and more on that later on the cancellation and revocation. Now, in terms of driver registration, um, let me start out by saying not all drivers are going to have to register, and you'll see in a second uh, a frequently asked question from the FMCSA to that effect. Um, but owner operators, they're going to have to designate a consortium or third party administrator to help them complete the process because owner operators under this clearinghouse rule are both an employer and a driver, provided they have their own operating authority. Um, now, some owner operators, you know, simply own or lease a vehicle and they operate under uh, an agreement with a motor carrier and they operate under that motor carrier's uh, authority and DOT number. And in those cases, the owner operator is, is considered a driver and doesn't have to register. But if the owner operator is both a driver and uh, an employer of themselves because it, by virtue of the fact that they have their own DOT authority and are using it, then, then again, the employer and the driver obligations apply. Um, drivers who are employee drivers or owner operators without authority, um, they may need to register. Uh, and, and again, we'll, we'll, I'll show you the, the DOT FMCSA answer in a second, and, and the may is, I think, pretty important. Uh, and, and if they do have to register, that last bullet on this slide, registration will include multi-factor authentication. And, and that's simply, we've all sort of gone through that, right? That uh, when we register with certain websites, we have to provide a, an email and maybe a cell phone number so they can follow up with a security code. And again, that's multi-factor authentication is, is a security-related uh, requirement as a part of this registration process for, for the drivers. Okay, so here's that FAQ that I've referenced a couple times. Does every driver need to register for the clearinghouse? Um, think about this for a second before we even get into that answer. Think about how many drivers are in the motor carrier industry today. It's it's in the millions. It's it's in that four to six million range of, of CDL holders, uh, both in turn intrastate but not every driver is going to have to register. Clearinghouse registration is not a required step for the drivers. It's not in the rules. So if a driver is never required to consent to a pre-employment or other full query, which we'll talk about more in a second, and never incurs a drug or alcohol violation, that driver is not going to need to register for the clearinghouse. So there will be a host, whole host of drivers in our industry that will not need to register by January 6th and may never need to register. And let me, let me put a finer point on that if I could. Think about a, and I like to use the LTL example because a lot of LTL line haul routes are, you know, sort of regular routes, you know, five days a week. A lot of drivers, you know, the, the LTL has less turnover than maybe truckload does. LTL driver, 25 years, loves his job, loves the regularity, likes to pay, you know, is, is comfortable with where he is in, in life. He's been working for that company for 25 years, is sober, clean hasn't had a drug and alcohol violation, probably never will, that driver is never going to have to register for the clearinghouse because they want to continue that job for the next 10 years before they retire. So there are a lot of people in that category, uh, but there's even more probably in the category of, yep, they're going to be looking for, you know, the grass is always greener at the next carrier, and so they'll have to register. So I just wanted to make, make sure everybody knew that not every driver within their company is going to have to register by January of, uh, 6th of 2020. So... Um, again, some, some of the details about motor carrier requirements beyond registration. Now we're getting into the pushing and the pulling of data. So let's start with the, the pulling of the data out of the system. We've already, I've already mentioned there's full queries and limited queries. Now full queries uh, are to be done at the pre-employment stage. When a, when a trucking company or motor carrier is hiring or considering hiring a driver, um, the whole idea of, of the clearinghouse is to make sure that that driver doesn't have past drug or alcohol violations that have disqualified them or made them unqualified to drive for some period of time. So uh, on, on a pre-employment basis, a full query has to be uh, made 
And so the carrier has to, to make that query in the clearinghouse. But before that query, before that request is, is granted by FMCSA and the clearinghouse, the driver has to go into the clearinghouse and make a consent. They have to give consent each and every time there's a full query made on, on their, for their record. So this is actually, you know, to, to Joel's point earlier, you know, are we even going to like what we see and like what stood up? And, you know, the industry has asked for this database for a lot of years to close the loophole of drivers, you know, uh, uh, fudging on employment applications that maybe they didn't have a violation when in reality they did. Well, here's, here's a, an aspect of this clearinghouse that could create some real operational challenges at, uh, or at least slow down the hiring process. If a driver registers and then has to go into the clearinghouse uh, when the full query for their record is made by the prospective, you know, the hiring carrier, I mean, let's face it, some drivers are just going to flat forget their login credentials. They may have registered two weeks ago or two months ago, uh, and they, they've forgotten what their username is, they've forgotten what their password is. We've all done that. And so drivers are going to do that, and it's going to hang up the, the hiring process. So, so the fact that a driver has to go into the clearinghouse on a full query and provide consent, that's potentially a real challenge for, for some carriers and some drivers. So I just wanted to make a note of that. Um, the, the full record request or the full uh, query is going to show any violation of Part 382, which is the, the drug and alcohol testing regulations and the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations. And it's also going to show a return to duty status, whether the driver is qualified you know, to operate a commercial motor vehicle. The data in the system is going to last uh, and be available for five years or until that RTD or return to duty uh, test and process has been completed, whichever is longer. So basically five years as a minimum or potentially longer if the return to duty process uh, takes that driver longer. Um, any driver with data in the system and the system doesn't reflect that they've completed the return to duty test and testing process, they can't drive. They can't serve in a uh, safety, sen uh, safety sensitive role or, or um, under the regulation. So, so there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of details here. I know I'm going through them pretty quickly uh, and, you know, this, we're recording this, and you'll have access to the recorded file as well and these slides if you'd like. Um, so, but, but the full query basically happens at pre-employment, but it could also happen later on as a follow-up to a limited query. So let's get into the limited queries. The limited query is simply a query that a motor carrier is going to have to do at least on an annual basis for all of their existing drivers. So uh, what, what's the difference between a full query and a limited query? Uh, it's when you do it, and it's also the information that comes back. The limited query is simply uh, a request, does information exist in the clearinghouse? Is there information about Dave Oshecki in this new clearinghouse? And if the answer comes back yes, um, then the limited query has to be converted by the motor carrier into a full query. In other words, it says, yes, there's information about me in the clearinghouse, and you're thinking about, uh, you know, retaining me as a driver within your business, then you have to go see and seek that full record. Okay, what's in the record? What happened? What did I do? Um, so, again, limited is for the annual check requirement. Think of this as, a, as an annual MVR, you know, conceptually as the annual MVR poll. So you have to pull a clearinghouse uh, record at least once a year, uh, and if there's no record, it simply indicates, hey, there's no record, no information exists. If there is a record, then you've got to convert it to a full query within 24 hours, as the slide indicates. Um, now let's shift to the, the third bullet down here, driver consent for limited queries. It is required, but it's not like the full query. It's not, uh, the driver doesn't have to log on and go into the clearinghouse to give his or her consent. They can do that consent once at the start of their employment at your business, at the, uh, at the company. And that consent can be added to other general consent forms, maybe a criminal history records check or, you know, an MVR consent form records check. Uh, all of those consents that a driver does typically on, on an application, paper or electronic application, this consent for limited queries can be added. Uh, the one restriction there is we have in parentheses. It can't be added to the, the pre-employment pre screening program consent form. That's a standalone form that has to be separate. Otherwise, it can be added. Um, and another point to be made about limited queries, carriers can conduct the limited queries more frequently than once a year if, if they desire. And if they do that, if you, if you, 
many carriers, you know, pull MVRs more than once a year. They may do it quarterly or, or every six months. You can certainly do this as well for limited queries, but the driver consent form that the driver signs at, at the beginning of employment really should uh, accommodate that. It should indicate that the, the limited queries will be done, you know, whatever the carrier chooses to do them if they're more frequent than once a year. So uh, again, a lot of information here, full queries, limited queries, and that's pulling data out of the system. Just a few more um, provisions in the regulations. The employer notification after a query. So an employer makes a query, whether it's a full or limited, if that driver's record changes within 30 days of that query, there's going to be a, a notification by FMCSA to the company that, hey, data has been added or removed or corrected in a driver's record. You need to log on and, and take a look at that. So it's a 30-day it's a window uh, around that uh, query uh, that FMCSA will push information or push a notification to the company or to the person in the company making that query advising that person to go back into the system and see what happened, see what information was added, removed, or corrected. Okay, a little bit more. There are drivers in our industry, of course, that are multiple uh, employer drivers. So they work for you know, company A uh, Monday through Friday, and they work for company B on Saturday. Uh, both employers need to fulfill that annual query requirement, the limited query. Um, and if a multi-employer driver fails a drug test, they have to notify in writing the employer who did not perform the test. Um, now, if every driver notified their employer in writing when they do something wrong, we wouldn't need things like this clearinghouse. So I'm, I'm not overly optimistic that this driver notification in writing is, is really going to work uh, in reality. But that's, that is an obligation on the driver if they work for different employers uh, you know, as part of their business. Um, and, and that notification has to be done before the end of the day. You can see the, the rest. And FMCSA can enforce that provision. There's a, you know, information on this slide. Uh, but there, there are certain obligations on multi-employer uh, drivers as well. So just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. Okay, a few more motor carrier requirements. Starting on January, 20, uh, January 6th of 2020, this clearinghouse is going to be collecting information. You're going to have to do these uh, full queries and limited queries. Right, so all of these requirements come into effect. At the same time you're doing full queries as a motor carrier employer, as a trucking company, for the first three years of a clearinghouse, you're also going to have to go back to the previous employer and request the drug and alcohol history of that driver. Just like you do today, if you're hiring a CDL driver, there's an obligation for you to go back three years, previous employers, and ask for drug and alcohol testing history, in addition to accidents and some other information, right? Um, this clearinghouse, this full query on a pre-employment basis, does not take that that previous employer inquiry away for the first three years, for January 6th of 2020 through January 6th of 2023. It's only after the first three years, when the when the um, clearinghouse gets populated with three years worth of data, does that um, uh, previous employer inquiry go away, or we use the word sunset on this slide. And then there are still obligations on some employers to do previous employer inquiries, even after that sunset date of 2023, uh, if you know certain things are met. And, and you can see them on the slide. There's a lot of detail here, and, and I'm not going to go into that because that's that's probably an exception for most companies versus a rule. But do know that the the general rule is after the first three years of the clearinghouse, the previous employer inquiries go away. But there are still some previous employer inquiries that must be made if certain drivers, um, you know, and, and the one I'll highlight it is drivers operating in other regulated modes. If a, if a driver operated in, a, uh, in the railroad industry and was being drug and alcohol tested in the railroad industry under DOT's rules, those uh, violations, if, if there are any, are not going to be in this clearinghouse. These are only motor carrier specific DOT drug and alcohol testing regulation. So that's the purpose for the, the previous employer inquiries after the first three years. All right, so lots of information here. Okay, we've been talking about pulling data out of the system, right, the queries. So let's shift over to pushing data into the system. What violation information must be uploaded by the carrier or by their service agent? And there's, again, there's a lot here, 
uh, but it's only DOT FMCSA testing program information as I've already stated. So it's part 382 violations and to the extent that there are some part 40 violations, uh, they would need to be reported as well. But, but really it's alcohol confirmation tests that are 0.04 or greater. There's a refusals to be tested by a driver for alcohol. There's refuses to be te uh, refusals to be tested for drugs. Um, and those refusals that do not require an MRO determination. So refusals that, that the motor carrier is aware of and, and have responsibility for. Um, actual knowledge violations, you'll see some additional information on that in a second. Negative return to duty re uh, test results, as well as completion of, of follow-up testing uh, plans or programs. So th that's the information violation information of Part 382 that um, that employer or motor carrier employer, when it occurs, needs to push into the system. They need to do that by the end of the third business day after after they are become aware of that violation. And again, it's only Part 40 and 382 violations, and it's only those violations on or after January 6th of 2020, the prospective piece we've already talked through. All right, there's some detail about refusals to test. Um, you know, by now your head may be spinning with all of the, all of these details about the clearinghouse, um, but there, there are certain types of failures, to, uh, refusals to test that an employer will know about that there's no MRO or medical review officer involvement. So failure to appear within a reasonable time, you know, a driver's notified, hey, got to go take your random, and the driver fails to appear within, you know, in the next few hours. So that's one of the refusals to test. Refusals to remain at the testing site until the process is complete. Refusing to or failing to provide a, a urine sample. So you, you can see there's there's some detail here and, and uh, again m most drivers are not going to be in this category. Most drivers are going to take the test and they're not going to refuse but when it occurs there are certain types of you know uh, specific failures and refusals that have to be pushed into the system by the motor carrier. Um, all right, shifting to return to duty, when an employer gets a, a negative uh, return to duty test result, that also, also has to be pushed into the system um, by the motor carrier or their service agent. Actual knowledge. Um, I know we're, you know, there's, there's, it may seem like there's just so much here, and, and there really is, um, but there's also an obligation. So we talked about refusals to test. If the motor carrier has actual knowledge of certain violations, in other words, you had direct observation of actual use of alcohol on the job or controlled substance, um, or if there's an admission by the driver of drug and alcohol use while on duty, uh, or if you receive information from a previous employer and it directly uh, communicates a, a Part 382 violation, or there's a traffic citation for driving a CMV under the influence. If, if, if you're in that situation as an employer, um, that needs to be reported into the system under the category of actual knowledge. There's a couple of caveats you can see. Um, if a driver is cited on a weekend, he's off duty, is in his, his pickup truck, he's you know has nothing to do with work, um, that citation for DUI is not to be reported into the clearinghouse. And that second caveat there is if a driver admits to drug use as a part of a voluntary, what they call self-identification program, uh, un under the DOT testing rules, some carriers have these voluntary programs where drivers can come forward and say, hey, I have a problem, before they're ever selected for a random, or before they're identified with a, maybe a reasonable suspicion test. Uh, they come forward, I've got a problem, I need to go get it addressed. Those types of voluntary admissions are not reported to the clearinghouse. Um, some other things about actual knowledge. Uh, you can't just uh, push an actual knowledge violation in without documentation. There has to be specific documentation of describing what the, the, the violation is. When did it occur? You know, who might have seen it or what other witnesses you might have. And some examples that are provided by the FMCSA, you can have written um, testimony or videos or you can have an affidavit or you know audio tapes or whatever there has to be some type of, of evidence uh, that accompanies the actual knowledge violation report into the clearinghouse um, and again that's a third business day following the event um, and there's there's some more information on here on this slide but I'll, I'll skip past it okay so shifting over to the driver requirements we're kind of rounding third and heading home on on the specific requirements in the webinar here, specific presentation. So with respect to driver requirements, um, I've already indicated 
uh, under the, the motor carrier section that driver consent is required for both query types, both full queries and limited. Full queries require that consent through the clearinghouse website. And again, I, I, I anticipate this being a, a challenge uh, during the hiring process and perhaps slowing it down. Um, but a full query is needed on a pre-employment basis and as I've mentioned, when the limited query returns information saying, yep, there's information in the database and then uh, the motor carrier has to convert that to a full query. So the driver, anytime there's a full query, pre-employment or when it's converted from a limited, driver has to go into the clearinghouse, log on and provide that consent. And really the consent is, is ch checking an electronic box in the system. Um, and that language is gonna be in there. The motor carrier doesn't have to add it to the system. It'll just be in there, driver checks the box. And it's also going to be stored in the clearinghouse. So uh, employers, motor carriers are not going to have to retain the, the consent for the, the full queries. It's already in the system. Now, uh, on, on the limited queries, again, that's up. That's between the company and the driver. That happens outside of the clearinghouse. Um, you get to decide as a motor carrier what that, what that language looks like. Um, and a lot of carriers are, are going to probably want a little guidance on that. And while FMCSA said that they're not, they're not going to prescribe a standard consent form for limited queries, they're going to provide a sample on their website. We recently learned that that sample is probably going to be put up in about the next three or four weeks on their website, so stay tuned for that if you think you may need a little help. Um, but again, it, uh, the, the limited query consent can be combined with other forms. It could be on your application form or, or so forth. Um, so uh, again, very, very limited um, you know, driver responsibilities, uh, but the, the consent is, is a big part of what has to be, uh, you know, on the driver's shoulders, but the motor carrier has to be a part of that as well. Okay, so record retention requirements. Um, the records have to remain, uh, records remain in the clearinghouse until the return to duty process is complete and five years have passed. So I've already mentioned that, kind of hitting, you know, on, on that again. Um, after the, the five year period or after the five years plus the return to duty test process completion, uh, it'll come out of the system, but FMCSA will still retain those records. They're going to they're gonna keep them they're archiving uh, in an archive file or folder, uh, and they may need it for auditing purposes at some point. Um, all the records for drug and alcohol violations have to be kept for a minimum of five years. That's under the Part 382 rules. Um, and any inquiries, any queries and information received, uh, you have to retain that until January 6th of 2023. So any clearinghouse records you get, you have to retain. Uh, after that, the clearinghouse records will, will really be uh, your record retention. Uh, they'll meet your record retention obligation. Okay. Lots here. A couple of other things, uh, other important rules. This, of course, there'll be a cost for making these queries. And I say, of course, may, maybe that's not obvious to, to some, but there will be a cost for, for making the full, full request and limited queries, and it'll be a pay first model. So if a company doesn't pay, you're not gonna get the information. And we recently learned also that the way that this is gonna work, and a lot of motor carriers, a lot of employers are gonna use a third party uh, a consortium or third party administrator or service agent to both push information in and, and help with the queries to pull information out during the hiring process. A lot of companies use, you know, background screening companies and consortium and so forth. Um, but they're not going to be able to, if they pull information out, if they're making a full query for a, on a pre-employment basis, the third-party service agent is not going to be able to pay for that and then bill it back to the motor carrier. The motor carrier is actually going to have to have money in the system, basically credits in the clearinghouse. And if, um, you know, call it $100, and, and we don't yet know what the transaction fee is going to be, but w whatever query is made, let's call it three, two or three dollars. That two or three dollars will be taken off the hundred dollar uh, credit in the system. So the motor carrier is going to have to have money payment in the system from which uh, the the query fees are going to be drawn down from. Okay, FMCSA can cancel registrations for anyone hasn't who hasn't used a clearinghouse in two years. In fact, I said they may. Uh, the the rule says they will. So if a, if a registration uh, rests dormant, if a motor carrier hasn't used the system for two years, uh, their registration will be canceled. They can also revoke registrations, they being FMCSA, and they can revoke it for inaccurate or false information if they're aware of the inaccurate or false information was submitted. 
uh, or if somebody misappropriated their access rights, they gave their uh, their login credentials to someone that should not have uh, had them and that person used them, they can be revoked for that and, and other things as well. And what's interesting to me, and, and I've said this on a number of webinars, if a carrier gets access revoked, uh, their access revoked, and they, they're still in business, they still have to hire drivers, they're still going to have to query the clearinghouse, but they can't do it directly. So they're, they're going to have to use an alternative method, which may include direct contact with FMCSA, which I think a lot of carriers will probably want to avoid. So again, that's going to be the small exception versus the rule, but there is a process in place for that. All right. A couple of other things, things we don't yet know. We don't know exactly when the clearinghouse is going to be open for business. Uh, FMCSA has said October, so that's our expectation. We don't yet know the full costs for this, um, you know, for the for the queries. The transaction fees for the queries are, have been described to us by FMCSA to us as not significant. Um, and in fact, we, we do expect a cost differential between the full and the limited queries. We think the full queries will be more costly than the, the limited queries. But again, if you think about it, if they're not significant and and maybe this is more information than what you need, but the underlying law that, that uh, provides authority to the DOT to create this clearinghouse says that FMCSA can only collect fees to cover the operations and the maintenance of the clearinghouse itself. So really there's this cap on the, on the amount of a fee that, that can be charged by FMCSA. Um, so we, we don't yet know what they're, but we, we think they're going to be in the, the low single digit, you know, dollar range. Um, a PSP report, as an example, if you use PSP and you access it, it's $10 to get a PSP report. This is going to be significantly less than $10, perhaps one, two, three dollars. We just don't yet know. Um, a batching process for queries. The, the bigger a company is, uh, the more people they will they will hire uh, annually, and the more people they're going to have to do the annual limited checks or limited queries on, and there will be a batching process for for the queries. We just don't know what that looks like yet. We're starting to get some detail, but I'll spare you the details because because uh, we don't fully understand those quite yet. Um, state driver licensing actions, of course, either, you know, the clearinghouse uh, applies to CDL drivers, right? So there's going to be some CDL. Renewals and when that renewal happens, the state DMV will have to look into the clearinghouse and what actions, uh, you know, correspond to what types of violations we don't yet know because FMCSA hasn't defined those for the state. And last, we don't know FMCSA's enforcement posture in 2020. What we do know, what my experience tells me, is any major regulation, whether it's the ELD implementation or ELD mandate or whether it's this clearinghouse mandate. Um, there is typically a soft enforcement period granted uh, to allow for understanding and carriers to get up in full, into full compliance and so forth. We, we would expect that, uh, but there's been no announcement that that's the case yet. So um, let, let's, let's end with this timeline uh, that we started with. This is a shortened version, so we expect October of 2019 for the registration process to open. We expect the compliance date of January 6th of 2020 to hold, and that's when the mandatory reporting of violations should begin, and as well as the, the mandatory you know, uh, inquiries or queries. And then that, uh, that three-year period for the, the previous, inquiry, previous employer inquiry sunset. So I uh, just wanted to end on that. And really, you know, there's, there's been a lot of, you know, I spent a lot of time here talking about some of the details of the rules. There's lots of new rules. There's lots of new learning here for, for trucking companies and other employers like driver staffing companies that employ CDL holders. Uh, if you haven't done yet, uh, done so yet, I'd encourage you to go to this clearinghouse website that FMCSA has created. Again, it's an education and outreach website. You can sign up for, for email updates. Uh, you may want to think about encouraging your drivers to go to that site, to, to read, to learn, and perhaps sign up for emails uh, themselves if they want to get direct emails from FMCSA or if you want them to get direct emails from FMCSA. Um, something I didn't spend a lot of time on or I didn't spend any time on, but I, I just want to alert you to the fact that there is this new section, uh, 382601, in fact, it's it's, it's B12, there's a section of that uh, paragraph in that section, which requires you to update your current drug and alcohol policy that you have on file within your business. So I would point you to 382601 
B12, if you're taking notes, um, because that directs, I believe there are 11 new items that have to be incorporated into a company policy that's associated or related to the, uh, to the clearinghouse responsibilities that we're talking about. Um, think about training needs for your drivers and staff. This is, this is new for everybody. So it's going to be new, new for the staff that have to access the clearinghouse, uh, and some of you may be on this call. Um, and it's certainly going to be new for, for drivers, um, particularly if they you know, are drivers who move from company to company. There's a registration process, the consent obligations, and so forth. Uh, I'd encourage you to start talking to your consortiums and third-party uh, administrators and, and other service agents, background screening companies you might use to see how they might help sort of take the, the load off of you as a trucking company. Um, and just be aware that you're going to face additional costs and compliance burdens. I wish we could give you the cost of transaction fees today. We can't. But I think it's pretty clear that um, the costs are going up, compliance burdens are going up, the administrative sort of hassle factor is going up during the hiring process, particularly because of, of the, the double, uh, the fact that you've got to query the clearinghouse for the pre-employment and you have to continue to go back to the previous employers for the first three years of the clearinghouse. So lo lots, lots to be had. Um, and, and candidly, we, we did the short version here for you today and, and now Joel, uh, after providing lots of information and lots of commentary, we'll shift to the questions and answers, and uh, I'm going to make an assumption maybe you have some in your possession at this point. Yeah, thanks, Dave. Perfect. I, I appreciate it. <clears throat> yeah, there's a lot to think about here. You know, this impacts the uh, speed of hiring, uh, the number of drivers going to be hired. Um, a number of the um, attendees here are, are on contract with uh, government or whoever. And this uh, adds cost as well, so a lot to consider. So thank you, Dave. Uh, yes, if you have questions, we only have a couple of minutes here, so send your questions to info at lowtrek.net. That's info, I-N-F-O, at lowtrek.net. And uh, Dave, we got a couple here. I'm going to start off with the easy one. I've had numerous people uh, email in about the uh, recording of this webinar. Yes, if you are a registered attendee of this webinar, you will receive an automated email that has a link to the recording. Sometimes these automated emails get caught in spam filters at various levels. If you do not get, uh, and it takes a couple of minutes, uh, actually it takes about an hour for the recording to process. So if you do not get a copy of the, uh, a link that has a copy of the recording, please email me, e info at lowtrek.net. That's info at lowtrek.net. I'll make sure you get a link. Uh, Dave got a question here that's kind of a big deal, so I'm going to ask it to you first. Uh, will the clearinghouse only list names of those with other than negative drug or alcohol results? For example, if a company rep seeks the name of an applicant in the clearinghouse and does not find the applicant, can it be assumed that the applicant is negative? Yes. Yeah, it, the, the short answer is, is yes to that question, and, and there's sort of two elements to it. Um, but, but the overarching or overriding principle, this is a clearinghouse or a database that only captures violations. And if, and if the, the query returns no information, um, then it, it can be assumed that there is no you know, past violations. The one, the one thing that I didn't say uh, during the webinar, and perhaps I should, when, you're, when a carrier is making a query, whether it's a full or a limited query, um, part of that query request has to include the driver's name, date of birth, CDL number, and CDL state, you know, state of issuance. And that information will be checked against SIDLIS, the Commercial Driver License Information System. So the carrier provides the driver name, database, uh, you know, date of birth, and so, or not, uh, CDL number, CDL state. The system goes and pings SIDLIS to see if that driver is indeed a CDL holder in that state. Um, and so that's sort of the verification that, yep, this driver is a CDL holder. Yep, that's the right state. Nope, there's no information. So that's a long answer to a short question, but I hope it's helpful. Yeah, that's good. Um, next question. This is kind of interesting. Um, I'd love to know if we've got the answer to this. Uh, 
the question is about the output. Uh, when we make a query, what does the output look like? And we may not know this yet. I don't know if Volpe's done with their work, but uh, will items in the limited query be dated so that multiple queries are not repeated unnecessarily? In other words, do we have any idea what the output's going to look like? How's it going to be formatted? Will it be dated? Do we know that yet? Yeah, we don't. We don't yet know that. Um, we we certainly the 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 query the date on the query you know going in will will be obvious um, when the, when the inf when the output comes back um, if if information was added it may not be there may not be a date that information was added um, and and I'm I'm being a little vague here because again we're not sure what that looks like um, and and you know one of the things that I think we're we're going to see as an industry we're going to see FMCSA this fall. In fact, it's starting next week. They're going to start showing the industry at, at particular uh, trucking conferences. They're going to Great American Trucking Show. They're going to start showing the industry what this thing looks like. Um, and, and maybe there might be a, a beta testing opportunity at these shows. But the, the more they do that, the more we're going to see, the more we're going to understand what, what the query, you know, how that works, and then what the, in, what the output looks like and how you access it and so forth. But it's a good question. I just don't think we know the answer to it yet. Okay, thank you. Well, with that, it's um, almost time to end. Uh, we have a number of questions here. I believe they were answered during the uh, webinar. Again, if you don't get a copy or an email with a, a link to a copy of this recording, please let me know, info at lowtrack.net. If you need to get a hold of Dave Oshecki, uh, on the screen you'll find phone number and email address as doshecki at scopeleadersconsulting.com. Again, Dave, wonderful source of knowledge. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, everyone have a good afternoon. Thanks, Joel.